Part 1, The Murders Begin The year was 1968, and Italy was in the midst of a cultural and political revolution. It was a time of social upheaval, with protests, riots, and political assassinations dominating the headlines. In the midst of all this turmoil, a series of brutal murders began to take place in the hills surrounding Florence. The first victim was a young couple, Barbara Loxai and Antonio Lo Bianco. They had been on a romantic night out, enjoying the beautiful Tuscan countryside, when they were attacked and killed. Their bodies were found the next morning, and the police were immediately called in to investigate. It was a shocking crime, but it was only the beginning. Over the next several years, a string of similar murders would take place in the same area. Young couples were targeted while they were parked in their cars, enjoying the romantic scenery. They were shot, stabbed, or bludgeoned to death, and their bodies were often mutilated in gruesome ways. The killers seemed to be taunting the police, leaving behind bizarre clues and cryptic messages. He was never caught, and the people of Florence lived in fear of the monster of Florence. Part 2, The Investigation The investigation into the monster of Florence murders was one of the most complex and convoluted in Italian history. It involved multiple police agencies, including the Carabinieri, the Polizia di Stato, and the Guardia di Finanza. Over the years, dozens of suspects were identified and questioned, but none of them could be definitively linked to crimes. Some were mentally unstable, others had criminal records, and still others were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But despite the best efforts of law enforcement, the monster of Florence continued to kill. In 1981, the case took a bizarre turn when two men, Pietro Paxiani and Mario Vanni, were arrested and charged with the murders. The evidence against them was circumstantial at best, and many believed that they had been scapegoated by the police in an effort to close the case. The trial was a media circus, with the two defendants proclaiming their innocence and pointing the finger at each other. In the end, Paxani was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, while Vani was acquitted. But many people remained convinced that the real killer was still out there. Part 3, New Leads and Dead Ends in the years that followed the Paxani trial, the investigation into the monster of Florence murders continued. New leads were pursued, old evidence was re-examined, and suspects were interviewed again and again. But despite all the effort, the case remained unsolved. One of the most promising leads came in the late 1990s, when a man named Giancarlo Lotti came forward with information about the murders. Lottie claimed that he had been part of a group of men who had committed the killings, and that he had even participated in some of them himself. The police were skeptical of Lottie's claims, but they decided to investigate anyway. They discovered that Lottie had ties to a group of wealthy and influential men in Florence, some of whom had been implicated in previous investigations into the murders. But once again, the evidence was not strong enough to make any arrests. Another promising lead came in 2005, when a woman named Patrizia D'Amico was arrested and charged with being an accessory to the murders. D'Amico was the ex-wife of a man named Francesco Colomandre, who had been a suspect in the case for many years. The police believed that D'Amico had helped Colomandre cover up his involvement in the murders, and that she had even, 